Hello and welcome to Troubleshooting Zen Study and Practice. This time our question is, sometimes I get strange sensations during Zazen. Is this normal? Well, this is a not uncommon question uh, from people who perhaps are dipping their toe um, into the practice of uh, Zazen or meditation in general even. Um, People, certainly at the beginning, um, can have some peculiar experiences that they're not used to. And these can be anxiety producing uh, sometimes, particularly if they are quite powerful. Um, these, the sort of TLDR of this um, is that, in fact, these experiences are quite normal. Um, and they come and they go. In fact, usually what happens with most people is that uh, things begin to settle down and, and one sort of gets gets used to it. And, and really a little bit, it's like um, anything that we're undertaking for the first time. Um, the novelty of it is, is going to uh, stir a few things up and, and we may begin to feel a little bit anxious at first. And particularly perhaps if we're practicing on our own, we don't necessarily have someone you know, um, at hand uh, to whom we can talk to, then of course this can um, make us feel a little bit um, vulnerable. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, um, you know, by far uh, these things really do just settle down. Obviously, in recent times, there's been a sort of burgeoning meditation and mindfulness movements, and and now you can barely turn a corner without seeing something uh, to do with pra wanting to practice meditation and so forth. So a lot of people are doing it. And um, I have seen some articles in various magazines sort of saying, oh, you know, is this actually safe? And for some people, they have really awful experiences during meditation. But I have to say, having looked at a few of them, and this is just purely anecdotal, um, having looked at, at a few of them, um, Sometimes what people do is they start a meditation practice um, and they go from nothing to trying to sit for long periods of time. Or even worse, they go from barely having you know done 10 minutes practice using, say, uh, one of these meditation apps like Headspace, which are perfectly fine, uh, to doing uh, a 10-day Vipassana retreat where you're perhaps sitting nine hours meditation. I mean, that would be like, you know, uh, 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 going from a brisk walk for half an hour in the morning to running a, a full marathon of 26 miles. Um, you know, you're going to injure yourself if you make that sort of leap. And so, you know, the skill of meditation, the ability to be able to sit still, um, uh, uh, which obviously does have a very powerful effect, uh, if if you do it too intensely, too quickly, uh, then rather like if you do exercise, vigorous or, or intense exercise, too vigorous, too quickly and for too long, um, will you're very possible that you'll pull a muscle or break something. Um, at very worst, you might even trigger a heart attack. So, you know, not advisable. So as with all things, same with meditation, start small and build up. Um, over a period of time, you'll find that, uh, and if you you know sit consistently, uh, then sitting a ten day vipassana retreat, whilst always going to be challenging, um, you know, is certainly not going to injure you, and in fact, will do what it's supposed to do, which is provide insight into the workings of one's own heart mind, uh, which is what we're about here. Um, on the on the Buddha's path, the Buddha's path is, um, as he beautifully said, um, uh, uh, it's a path that leads to an uh, an ancient path that leads to an ancient city. That ancient city being the human heart itself. And Bodhidharma, the first patriarch, said uh, that our task is to um, look into the nature of our own heart, realize it, and become Buddhas. So, however, uh, which way we describe it, if we're on a spiritual path, such as the uh, uh, such as this path, the, the Zen Buddhist path, um, then discovering the nature of our heart is what we do. And meditation is one of the ways that we do this um, as well. So naturally, it's going to feel a little bit strange at first. And um, 
perhaps, um, although, as I said, the TLDR is, is that ha feeling a few strange sensations is quite normal uh, and that they, these sensations will come and go and that they're nothing really to, to worry about um, uh, in themselves uh, and not to become, you know, unduly anxious about them. Um, it might be useful perhaps just to uh, perhaps widen this out and, and say, well, what's actually going on when we, uh, when we sit meditation? And I think perhaps from a sort of psychological point of view, it's important to point out um, that when we sit meditation, what we're doing is to quote a, uh, uh, perhaps a sort of, uh, uh, or, or to, to use a sort of common uh, a turn of speech where we are expanding consciousness that is we're actually becoming more conscious um, of what's happening um, in the heart and in the body um, and if you think about it and I mean you know if you've if you've read anything about neuroscience you will know that you know we have our five physical senses um, and those five physical senses whether we're conscious of them or not are taking in a vast amounts of data vast amounts of information um, and and what the mind does is it screens out an awful lot of it uh, simply because it would be you know overwhelming and we wouldn't be able to function so there are a lot of filters uh, in uh, that if you like form a sort of bridge um, or, a, or a barrier or a border if you like between um, all the information that's coming in through the sense gates and also, you know, what we are immediately in this moment actually conscious of. And that allows us to be able to concentrate and to focus consciousness, which allows us to function, you know, um, in this world. Um, and if we didn't have this, then we would be, you know, all over the place. The other, th the other thing, obviously, um, uh, uh, is that there's, as well as the five physical senses, as you will know, in Buddhism, there are six senses. The sixth sense being what's known as the uh, sense of uh, mental um, cognition. That is the awareness of, our, of an inner world. So, you know, the thoughts that we hear or the images that we see internally, uh, the sights and sounds that uh, to, I like to use the term the inner landscape because it gives the uh, sense of, you know, this, this whole inner world. And if you've ever had a daydream or, or a dream, you know, you, uh, we can enter into whole new worlds. You know, if you're a creative writer or an artist, you'll be very familiar with the, of this inner landscape where you see colours and forms and stories. And, you know, if you have to do a piece of creative writing and you just sit down and you know, see what pours out of you. Um, you, you know, I'm sure you must wonder from time to time, my goodness, where does all this stuff come from? Um, because surely it must come from somewhere. Well, this somewhere the psychologists call the unconscious. So we have this, if you like, if, if you want to sort of have a visual um, uh, 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 map uh, of what's going on inside us. You can imagine a sort of vast space that's filled with all sorts of things, most of which is quite dark. Uh, but in one corner of this space, there's a light, and that light shines in that darkness, but it only shines so far. Uh, there's a limit to it. It's like a little sphere of light in a much larger uh, landscape of darkness. And, you know, as that um, uh, light moves around, it illuminates different things. You know, you might see a bookcase or you might see, um, you know, a, a TV uh, or a table um, or you might see a picture on the wall. And these things, you know, come into the light and then as the light moves on, they go out of the light. Um, and so there is this, if, if, if you imagine this light is moving, um, this light is constantly illuminating something and then that same object or image uh, vanishes back into the gloom uh, once more. And it's quite a good, um, I, think, I think it's quite a good uh, analogy for that sort of flow of thoughts and images and memories and um, ideas and so forth that uh, flow in and out of what we call our conscious awareness uh, uh, and that we can um, attend to. Uh, as well and so 
when we practice meditation, uh, what we're doing actually is is we're actually stilling uh, that light. Um, but at the same time, uh, the light itself begins to grow. That sort of sphere of light begins to expand uh, and we begin to take more in. And, and usually, you know, we, we have some kind of progression in practice. And if you're familiar with the Buddha's um, sutra or, uh, or scripture, called the Foundations of Mindfulness, the Satipatthana Sutta, you will know that there are four foundations that he advises that we practice using. And the first one is the body. So, you know, very often the, the first meditation that we do um, is to do with the body. And usually this is with the breath, the breath obviously being uh, something that is always with us, that's something that's always moving and something that's very physical. Um, as well and what this does of course is it allows our attention it allows our, our attending to the breath um, it, it allows the thinking center to you know to to relax uh, a little bit more um, and and become a bit more quiescent um, and in that way, we begin, um, uh, awareness begins to enter into, you know, the physical sensations of the body. And that in itself can feel strange because most of the time, you know, we, we're not aware of the sensations of the body. Um, even as you're listening to this talk, if, if I say to you, right, just become aware of the sensations in your feet, for example. Well, if you're sitting down and your feet are on the floor... Um, you know, you'll be able to feel the pressure of your feet on the floor. Um, and your feet may have been on the floor for the past 10 minutes or so. Um, but the thing is, you've, you, you've only just become aware of that uh, sensation of pressure when I mentioned it, because I, my words drew your attention uh, uh, to that. And probably by now, as I've carried on talking, that sensation has disappeared out of consciousness, although it may have just come back in because I've, you know, re-reminded you of it uh, but anyway you can you sort of get the idea um, you know uh, uh, these sensations are, are coming in and if we're if we if the heart or the focus of the heart um, or the focus of attention that to which we are attending to you know if we begin to attend to it uh, you know uh, uh, a little bit, bit more devotedly then yes it begins to deepen the experience of it. It's not just a physical sensation. Uh, there's all sorts of other little inflections and nuances um, to that sensation that can appear. And this is something that, you know, we uh, 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 we, exper we experience in longer sittings when we're on retreat. And perhaps we're experiencing pain, for example, because, you know, if whether you're sitting on a chair or with your legs crossed in the half lotus position um, on a cushion, for example, if you sit for long periods of time, naturally your muscles and your joints begin to get sore. Um, and, you know, the idea is that we sit with that pain. We don't just immediately, you know, uncross our legs or get up and walk about. We have to stay still during the periods of, of meditation. Um, and there's a purpose behind this. This is because we're getting to know the pain. We're getting to be able to sit with the pain and discover things about the pain. First of all, that the pain is changing. Uh, it's not always the same. And on top of that, there will be an emotional reaction as well that doesn't actually belong to the pain, uh, but that arises con as a consequence of it. So uh, as well as the pain, there will be you know, a feeling of, unpleasantness and then there'll be the thought that I don't like this unpleasantness um, and how long and then speculation and judgment how long uh, will it be before that idiot with the bell rings it so that I can move my damn legs um, all that sort of thing um, as well and all this sort of has to be gotten used to we, we're learning to contain this uh, so that the uh, uh, the reactions of the heart don't uh, get carried away uh, and that's all you know this is all part of the cultivation of inner strength uh, which obviously is a very useful virtue uh, to have in life so and um, when we sit with um, in meditation initially there as, as i say it's this 
there is this process of becoming more conscious. And the other thing that has to be said, and this is now where perhaps we do need to uh, be a little bit, um, you know, uh, more aware is is that because consciousness widens it's it's not just widening as I say in, in the physical side and as I said you know often enough we certainly initially become aware of the sort of physical sensations that are coming in through the physical senses and that is you know there's a heightened awareness of sounds for example so you know you um, it's can be quite nice if you're sort of meditating with the window open and you can hear you know the birds singing or the breeze in the trees or maybe the rain on the window pane something like that i mean these are very uh, commonly very pleasant sounds and you know they could be quite uh, blissful um uh, uh but then if we're sitting with a group of people and the person next to me you know has a a, a stuffy nose and is breathing uh, laboredly uh, and rather loudly that can become really annoying or if I can hear a dog barking, you know, um, two doors away, and it goes on and on and on, uh, and that then begins to become annoying, and I become irritated by that. Um, so again, we have the physical sounds, we have the judgments that I make um, onto those things, and then, you know, my reaction um, subsequently as a consequence uh, of, of my judgments that I place on the sensations. And so... You know, all these things, you know, we, we sort of have to work through. Um, but as well as these things, it also has to be said, um, as I said, there is an inner landscape as well. And, you know, as we are opening up, as we're becoming more conscious, or as some people like to say, more mindful, uh, prefer the term conscious and the awareness myself. Um, it's a bit more sort of grounded in a sort of physical experience. Um as we as we do become more conscious then of course you know things that are hovering near the threshold of consciousness but just in the unconscious um, can also become visible and um, what are some of these things well some of these things are things that have maybe been repressed and again those of who are sort of familiar with theories of repression um, will know that you know these are the things that um, I don't want to look at uh, that don't, you know, show me in a terribly good light or things that I'm afraid of um, about myself. Could also be memories as well. You know, you get repressed memories. And yes, these things can come up um, as well. And they don't always just come up initially, say, as a memory. Uh, they may come up as a, as a feeling, uh, maybe a feeling of dread. Uh, maybe a feeling of you know apprehension, uh, but something that might be very nebulous uh, and unclear, and it sort of acts like a herald. Um, and then, you know, um, over time, you know, a memory may come back about something that happened. So yes, I mean th these things certainly can and do happen, and so it's important that uh, a meditation practice is. Uh, part of a larger practice, uh, learning how to sit with the emotional reactions that are inevitably going to come up. And, and you know, I'm, I'm probably making it sound a little bit more traumatic than it actually uh, usually is. Um, and I must admit in the sort of 30 years or so uh, that I've been practicing meditation in Buddhism, and I actually practiced meditation before I came to Buddhism, so I've been doing it since I was a teenager, um, of one sort or another. Uh, it, I mean, in, in, in all those years, um, uh, 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 it's very, very, very rare that, that a person has found it to be, you know, overwhelming. In fact, I myself did have a period where um, I did it. When I first practiced Sazen, I was just practicing it, you know, I've been shown how to do it, but then practiced it by myself. I had no... Uh, sort of surrounding daily life practice or you know practice of working with the emotions um, uh, uh, to, to sort of back it up uh, and so uh, I what happened uh, with me is that I did actually have a period where I became 
uh, I began experiencing panics, sort of panic attacks. Um, again, these were these were unpleasant, but they weren't. I mean, they they, they certainly weren't debilitating, but I they were they were concerning enough that I actually went to the doctor uh, about them, and I did, you know, have a little bit of um, uh, uh, sort of therapy uh, for it, and then I I decided that I I wanted to go back into meditation, but that um, this time I wanted to do it under some supervision, which I did, and I never had any further problems with it. But to be honest, I've, uh, as I said, that was my own experience many, many years ago. I've been sitting meditation for years now. Um, never, you know, it's never been a problem uh, since that. And, and to be honest, that, you know, overwhelmingly the vast number of people I know um, uh, 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 I've, I've never had that sort of problem. Usually, the sorts of problems people have when they're sitting is, you know, and uh, is that the meditation either feels flat, um, that their minds are all over the place, suffering from what's called um, monkey mind, where it's just leaping from one thing to another, uh, grasping one thing and then the next thing, and so on. Um, so these are, you know, uh, and then you know. Have it, uh, uh, trying to sort of establish a meditation practice itself. Uh, you know, too many other things coming up to divert my attention away, and I never get back onto the meditation seat. So these are sort of some of the things uh, uh, that can actually happen. Just to say, with with that, one of the things about uh, powerful emotions and so forth. You know, if you do, because you do need something. It's a little bit like if you're very sleepy. You know. Uh, it's useful to have one or two things that you can do. Really, um, one of the best one of the best practices, you know, if you find yourself suffering from anxiety um, as a result of you know meditation, or really, at, I suppose at any time, um, this is when I get frightened. This is when. Why do I get frightened in, in meditation? Because I feel overwhelmed. So there's the feeling of I is still there. Which remember the Buddha said was ultimately a delusion but uh, the delusion is real even if uh, the separate entity called I doesn't isn't real um, the feeling of I is real and so it triggers that uh, anxiety well you know this is where this this is where the devotional attitude really comes into its own because it's almost um you know, it's almost biblical, really. If you remember some of those stories in the Old Testament about Moses seeing God and he had to avert his eyes or he had to kneel down and press his forehead to the, uh, to the ground. Because this is what you do when you are faced with an overwhelming force that you couldn't possibly, you know, contain, um, at least not initially. Um, nine deep bows or nine deep prostrations. You may sort of think, what, how's that going to work? But it does, it really does. Um, so this is something that you could do if you, know, if, if you did have this. I mean, I didn't know this at the time, but um, if I was giving advice to my younger self who was experiencing those panic attacks, it would be don't just lie there um, and uh, uh, suffer the panic, get up, uh, put the hands together into gasho and either bow or even better do nine prostrations where you bend the head down and touch it to the ground um, and ask the you know just just offer uh, offer yourself up um, it can it's a very powerful thing and, and why does that work because um, when the body bows the body is uh, uh, not it's, the body's not giving up, it's, but it's giving in. It's no longer resisting. And of course, what anxiety does is it seeks to resist whatever it is that it's experiencing. That's what the anxiety is. It feels that like it's going to be overwhelmed and then it r tries to push it away. And that's, um, uh, that's the anxiety uh, that does that. So when instead of doing that when instead we can really open up which means I have to get out of the way and that bow is a way of handing myself over to be out of the way to lay myself down um, then suddenly um, the anxiety goes as well and we discover that you know what appeared to be 
um, terrifying on the outside actually is quite different when we stand inside it. Um, uh, 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 Joseph Campbell, actually, the American mythologist, said, you know, the bodhisattvas have these two faces. One is benign and one is wrathful. And what the bodhisattvas do is that they're coming to open you up because I am, you know, my ego is, is tight, tightly bound into myself. And so when the Bodhisattva approaches, he appears in a wrathful form, all teeth and claws with a big fiery sword. And uh, I'm terrified. And then his sword crash, you know, smashes through this shell, this hard shell. And then suddenly the face changes to a most beautiful, uh, lovely, benign and blissful form. Um, and this is the true form of the Bodhisattva now but uh, what changes it is the attitude i take towards it uh, now this is all well and good um, but it's not enough just to try and talk myself out of fear i can't talk myself out of fear uh, fear operates at the gut level and so um, this is why the bow or the prostration um, is is so very powerful so okay um as i said sometimes a lot of these strange sensations though are nothing like that i mean uh, a lot of them are just you know might be peculiar itches or a feeling of something you know touching the body or uh, perhaps a feeling of expansiveness um but as i say a lot of these things certainly initially is just because of the novelty you know because we don't quite know what's happening uh, and so we might feel a little bit of anxiety about it. As I say, 99%, 99.9% of the time, uh, these things will just uh, come and go. One other thing I will just say, I always remember a nice little uh, sort of meditation story, sort of contemporary one, uh, of the uh, uh, vicar, uh, the, the, the sort of Christian minister who decided to you know, have a go at meditation. He'd heard a lot about it. So he, he goes along to a... a, a a class and uh, he's give, sat down on a mat and he sits in meditation and afterwards he goes up to the meditation teacher and he says thank you thank you he said that was amazing he said um you know after about 10 minutes once once the mind had sort of quietened down just a little bit i had this sensation of you know being enfolded in the arms of god he said it was magnificent uh, and the teacher nodded and said Good, good, he said. Now you carry on sitting and God will go away again. So, you know, it's not just unpleasant experiences. It can be blissful experiences as well and sensations that we have. But these are all treated all, all the same. They're all impermanent. They all come um, and they all go. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it there. So as usual, um, more than happy to uh, try and answer any of your questions about uh, practice of meditation, practice daily life practice, mindfulness practice, anything to do with the uh, Buddha's teachings and so forth. Uh, if you have your question, uh, just send it over uh, on an email to rinzai at thezengateway.com. That's rinzai, R-I-N-Z-A-I, at thezengateway.com. Com. Don't forget, we also have a YouTube channel as well called the Zen Gateway, and we also have the Dharma Center as well. If you want to, um, uh, if you want to take up some practice remotely, and you're too far away from a temple or Dharma Center uh, to be able to go in person, then come along. We have weekly uh, zazen sittings. Uh, we also have monthly tutorials with myself, um, and uh, uh, we also run courses. Uh, recorded courses so you can come along and learn about the Buddha's teachings in your own time so if you're interested in that you can again you can either write to me at the Rinzai at the zengateway.com or you can go and have a look on the zengateway.com uh, and just uh, click on the Dharma Center in the top navigation bar so until the next time um, all the best and good practice <laughs>